Hi, everyone. Sorry for the delay. I hope you're all well. Thanks so much for joining us wherever you're tuning in from. My name is James Kelly. I'm from Pluto Press, and I'm very excited to be here for the launch of Emmanuel Ness's new book, which is available now, Organizing Insurgency, Workers' Movements in the Global South. Looking at contemporary case studies in India, the Philippines, and South Africa, this book affirms the Global South is the epicenter of workers' struggles today. If you haven't purchased a copy yet, you can head over to plutobooks.com to pick up a copy of the book. Attendees of this event can get 30% off the paperback and ebook editions using the coupon, the coupon code NESTLAUNCH at the checkout. We have an excellent panel for you tonight, and this event also includes a Q&A section, so please feel free to ask your questions to the panelists in the chat below. And you can also tweet on the hashtag Organizing Insurgency. Uh, I think that's all for me. Over to you, Manny. Welcome, everyone, and I'd also like to, uh, to thank uh, Pluto Press for organizing this event. Um, I think it's a very important uh, discussion. Uh, most, if not all, the literature around the working class uh, in the West and beyond is a very critical uh, perspective on uh, its representation. And um, what, uh, what I've attempted to do today uh, actually over the last several years, is to demonstrate that there are, in fact, very important, vigorous, robust, and strong organizations that are succeeding in mobilizing working class people uh, throughout the world, and particularly the global south. So this is really a story about success. And so I think that's actually something that is innovative about the book. Uh, it does not really deal with failure. It's about success Very and the potential important. for even greater success in the years to come, which we, I'm confident we will see. Today, I'm really pleased to have um, a panel of guests uh, that represent two of the three countries uh, that are examined in this book, uh, which focuses on the question of poverty and working class representation. Uh, and the significance of organizational power uh, to build uh, a, a sense of class consciousness amongst uh, the working class. I, I would like to start with uh, Professor uh, uh, Jose Maria Sison. Uh, he is uh, Chairman Emeritus of the International League for People's Struggle, as well as uh, Chairman Emeritus and founder of the uh, uh, Communist Party of uh, the Philippines, uh, and uh, he is a prolific writer, uh, and uh, he will be speaking first. Uh, second, I would like to introduce you to uh, Sarah Raimundo. Uh, she is uh, a director of the international program at the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and uh, also a very uh, good comrade and activist, and uh, I'd like to say thank you for coming. And um, the third speaker, besides myself, uh, is um, uh, Comrade uh, Abhinav uh, Sinha. Uh, he is an activist uh, in India, and he is the editor of uh, uh, Beagle Mazdoor, uh, Workers' Bugle. Uh, and um, so uh, we shall start right now. I'll moderate this uh, event, and uh, we will start now with Professor Sisan. Thank you, Professor Ness, for your kind introduction. Dear friends, I thank the Pluto Press and Professor Emmanuel Ness for inviting me to speak on his book, Organizing Insurgency, Workers' Movements in the Global South. I convey warmest greetings of solidarity to all participating in this event. I congratulate Professor Ness for making a major critique of the neoliberal dogma that the capitalist class is the creator of social wealth and that by all means the bourgeois state must enable the capitalist class to accelerate the accumulation and concentration of capital by pressing down wages and maximizing the extraction of surplus value 
undermining trade union and other democratic rights, eroding job security and social benefits, hard won by the workers, increasing tax cutbacks for the benefit of corporations, privatizing profitable public assets, liberalizing trade and investments, deregulating the abuse of labor, children, women, and the environment, and denationalizing the economies of the global south. By examining and analyzing the practice and consequences of neoliberal capitalism in the global south, Professor Ness exposes the massive transfer of wealth from the workers to the capitalists, the super exploitation of the urban and rural proletariat, the widening inequality between the capitalist class and the working people, and the rapid impoverishment of the latter. He points out that the urban rural workers of the global south carry the world on their shoulders. He debunks completely the notion that under the neoliberal rule of unbridled greed, the monopoly corporations can bring about the high tide that lifts both the big ships and small boats of the over or the overflow of wealth at the tip of the pyramid would trickle down to the rest of society. In his book, Professor Ness points out that the global north takes advantage of the less developed economies of the global south which is 84% of the world's population and engages in super exploitation by taking their export of cheap raw materials and cheap labor in exchange for higher priced manufactured imports, as well as by developing global supply chains, whereby the value of the primary commodities and semi-manufacturers is transferred to the global north. But even then, the monopoly bourgeoisie undermines itself in its own home grounds by outsourcing manufacturing, producing mainly the bigger items for higher profits and financializing the economy. The long-term consequence for the working class in the global north is the reduction of employment and income and the increased frequency of rounds of the crisis of overproduction. In general terms, the workers in the global north are better off than those in the south, but their respective levels of working and living conditions keep on going down and deteriorating. They are losing jobs and earning less. Even the middle class is decreasing significantly. The monopoly bourgeoisie notices that even the cheaper consumer goods from the global supply chains strung out in the south are no longer enough to compensate for the increasing loss of jobs in the North. Organizing insurgency, workers' movements in the global South is excellent at focusing on the, on the working class in the global South and exposing the terrible consequences of neoliberal globalization. It debunks the notion that neoliberal globalization has resulted in the urbanization and development of the global south by simply pointing out that urban populations have indeed increased, but the rural populations have also increased at a faster rate as the breeding ground for cheap labor, the reserve army of labor, and the footloose workers commuting between the rural and urban areas. Moreover, urban poor settlements more squalid than the rural communities have arisen due to the migration of the semi-proletariat or seasonal odd jobbers from the rural areas. The urban and rural workers of the global south suffer the main brunt of the worsened conditions of exploitation and oppression under the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization. The multinational corporations do not care about the well-balanced development of any client economy. They invest only in their projects or enterprises from which they can get the highest and quickest possible profits by using cheap raw materials and cheap labor and by simply trading what are produced abroad. Professor Ness presents three case studies to show how the multinational corporations and the local big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists engage in the super exploitation and impoverishment of the working people in the global south, particularly the primitive steel manufacturing for the global consumer market in Vasirpur, India, the system of agricultural commodity production for the global north in Mindanao, Philippines, 
and the corporate restructuring, labor brokering, and working class mobilization in post-apartheid South Africa. Professor Nash debunks the claim of certain Indian economists and Western observers that the Indian working class is well-trained and skilled in modern production techniques. He averts that despite the fact that there are high technology centers in India, the Indian workforce is predominantly semi-proletarian and agrarian. Most of the industrial activity is at a primitive or crude level under extreme conditions of poverty, both in the rural countryside and in the major urban centers. The working and living conditions of workers in Delhi's Vasarpur industrial area are reminiscent of the Kenshin 19th century England. The industrial zone uses workers at extremely low wages and under dangerous conditions to produce the stainless steel kitchen utensils and tableware goods for the global commodity supply chains. Thus, it is no surprise that the steel workers have engaged in continuous struggles for two decades. Despite tremendous odds, the informal sector workers engage persistently in mass actions against the employers with the support of resolute and militant support of a political organization of the workers. Professor Ness correctly describes the Philippine economy as a country dependent on the extraction of mineral resources, agricultural commodities, and on migrant labor for the global supply chain. It is at the bottom of this chain, does not develop an industrial sector capable of producing machine tools, basic metals, and basic chemicals. The production of bananas, pineapples, mangoes, and other exotic tropical fruits is done in big plantations in Mindanao that are owned and operated by a combination of multinational corporations, big compradors, landlords, and bureaucrat capitalists. Among the biggest agri corporations are Dole, Del Monte, Fife, Sumitomo, and Tadeco. The plantation workers have no job tenure and are grossly underpaid. They're hired by labor contractors or brokers who are agents of the plantation owners, masquerade as leaders of rural workers' cooperatives to which the plantation workers pay membership dues. These so-called cooperatives are mere replications of the old Cabo system of recruiting farm workers for haciendas. The Kilusang Mayo Uno has done excellent work in arousing, organizing, and mobilizing the plantation workers to fight for their political and economic rights and interests. Professor Ness points out that in post-apartheid South Africa, 90% of the people remain in poverty and destitution suffering from economic and social inequality, despite the grant of political equality in the abstract. Thus, in the 2010s, workers in the mining industry carried out strikes and struggled against the corrupt National Union of Mine Workers and the ruling African National Congress and Tripartite Alliance, which reinforced inequality. The April 2012 Marikana massacre exposed the Tripartite Alliance government as the instrument of the economic interests of the white minority, black compradors, and multinational corporations at the expense of the South African black majority. The National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa broke with the ANC and then was expelled from the Congress of South African Trade Unions. NUMSA represented uh, the urban manufacturing workers and opposed the tripartite alliance and help in the formation of the United Front of Community Organizations, the South African Federation of Trade Unions, and the South African Revolutionary Workers' Party to mobilize the Black working class. While NUMSA has stood for political opposition, social transformation, nationalization of strategic industries, redistribution, and collectivization of lands, and the end of economic imperialism by foreign multinationals, workers have engaged in autonomous struggles against employers who have pushed workers into the subcontracting system in the informal economy. The Casual Workers Advice Office established unions among the growing number of workers recruited by labor contractors and brokers and the workers in small and dispersed factories. I appreciate Professor Ness's calling attention 
to the growing significance of informal sector workers in urban settlements and agrarian regions to global supply chains and to the need for labor mobilization and political struggles in these crucial geographic zones of the world. He stresses the significance of robust political organization in consolidating the gains of grassroots struggles and the practical potential in advancing effective struggles that may contribute to egalitarian social transformation. I commend Professor Ness for laying the basis and calling for organizing the insurgency of the workers. He gives due credit to the history and achievements of the proletarian revolutionary parties and socialist societies of the Soviet Union and China before they were undermined by modern revisionism and succumbed to capitalist restoration. Definitely, the workers must rise by building the trade unions, related social organizations, the workers' party, and the political movements of the working class. And may I stress that there ought to be a revolutionary party of the proletariat guided by the theory of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and determined to carry out all possible and necessary forms of struggle towards national liberation, democracy, and socialism. The insurgency of the working class and the global South is of decisive importance to encouraging the workers of the global North to rise up and to make their contributions to the resurgence of the world proletarian socialist revolution. All workers of the world and oppressed peoples and nations must unite and fight to reverse the setbacks of the socialist cause as a result of the concatenation and combinations of imperialist plunder, state terrorism, wars of aggression, anti-communism, social democratic reformism, neo-colonialism, modern revisionism, and neoliberalism. Neoliberal capitalism has been dominant for more than four decades already, but it's definitely unraveling, especially since the financial crash of 2008 and the consequent protracted crisis and depression of, of global capitalism. This has sharpened inter-imperialist contradictions, especially between the US and China, which were previously the main partners of neoliberal globalization. At the same time, the proletariat and people of the world are intensifying and expanding the anti-imperialist and democratic mass struggles of the proletariat and the oppressed peoples and nations. These struggles are the harbinger for the resurgence of the world proletarian socialist revolution. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Sisan, for those uh remarks. Uh, I'm very, very taken by them uh, emotionally even uh, and uh, appreciate them heartily. Um, and I think we need to examine them uh, further in uh, future debates. Uh, I would like to now uh, turn to um, uh, Dr. Sarah Raimundo uh, of the University of Philippines Diliman. Uh, she is um, in charge of the international program there. Uh, comrade, and um, uh, many people know her uh, to be a, a leading activist. Thank you. Um, good day, everyone. First, I wish to congratulate the author, uh, Professor Emmanuel Ness, Comrade Manny, for this yet another important work on the theories and concepts significant to understanding the status of workers in the Global South. Uh, in this book entitled Organizing Insurgency, Workers' Movement in the Global South, insurgency marks no less than revolutionary expectations. The main arguments of the book are derived from research across major economic regions uh, of economic production. Its emphasis is on the rural proletariat producing surplus value for global commodity chains. The book also contends that Quote, rural labor retains an enduring presence into the 21st century, thus agrarian regions are crucial to comprehending labor struggles today as they have not declined but expanded, unquote. In a few days, on June 12, the Philippines will commemorate its independence from Spanish colonialism, which also marks the subordination of the nation to U.S. imperialism. The so-called independence is formalized annually as the Philippine state reinforces continuation of 
uh, colonial hierarchies, which in more ways than one also shape and dominate the production of knowledge. Uh, this book not only speaks to the conditions of the working class in the global south, uh, it, is all, it is also a compelling critique of labor scholarship. Uh, Ness averse, and I quote, serious scholarship is built upon a resolute ref ref refutation of the latest fads and the captive labor intellectuals, which only confuse and distort a vivid conceptualization of the stark divisions that are appearing globally. Most recently, conceptual distortions of workers, the working class and working class organizations has emerged as scholars conjure up terms such as the precariat and autonomous unions. There are no new discoveries about the nature of labor and working class organizations. Concomitantly, we must reject the dominant view in the West that the working class is disappearing as a social force through the introduction of new technology and its application in the material world. Digitization and robotization are the latest iterations, but they will not change the calculus of class antagonism and the necessity for a working class and peasant organization." Unquote. Uh, this book should be of interest to anyone who finds all that cosmopolitan, purportedly anti-capitalist urban studies with its narrow focus on the development of cities wanting. Any critique of neoliberalism that fails to trace the phenomenon of fast growing cities to the massive dispossession happening in the rural areas is a symptom of one, an indecisive struggle over the mode of thinking in the global working class movement that refuses to deal with the agrarian question and thus the centrality of the movement of value from the global south to the global north. This tendency is a legacy of a counter revolutionary politics that Lenin battled with by lifting up the importance of the peasant class and the national question in national liberation or anti-imperialist struggle and socialist construction. And second, related to number one, a tendency in the academe to ignore the struggle for intellectual decolonization and what observably is a lip service to the same intellectual wager while rejecting the conduct of actual proletarian struggles in the global south. So this book is nothing like that. It engages the oft forgotten rural and informal labor struggles as it highlights the persistence of the system of agricultural commodity production in the global south for first world commodity extraction as exemplified in great detail in the case of Mindanao, Philippines. Uh, Ness addresses this gap not only for the sake of data presentation and analysis, but precisely to argue for the validity of a politics that has been denigrated both by puppet states in the periphery and the neoliberal university. The nature of this work, which goes beyond the book, is traceable to a mode of scholarship that is revolutionary. It is an indispensable contribution to the continuous building of what Engels calls the political power of the proletariat. Ness uh, Ness is an equivocal critique of various forms of modes of thinking on workers' organization and the importance of wielding a highly organized socialist consciousness drives home the point in a comprehensible manner. Building proletarian consciousness transforms the capitalist mode of production to a socialized mode of production. How so? Ness is confident about socialist revolutions in the 21st century, but for him, and I quote, Labor solidarity cannot be built on the shoals of higher consumption and living standards in the North at the expense of poverty, inequality, and environmental degradation in the South. This requires a socialist movement propelled by militant anti-imperialist political organization in the South." Unquote. This kind of cognition or understanding of the world is inseparable from the material conditions that shape knowledge and our very own understanding um, of the world. From his work, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, Lenin points to a process of re-education accurately describes, uh, ac uh, which is accurately described by um, Stefan Engel as a dialectical movement from petty bourgeois to a proletarian mode of thinking. It is not possible to impose this process on any scholar. It can only be accomplished voluntarily and while marching side by side, so to speak, with the working class. In the same work, Lenin elaborates, quote, no one will venture to deny that the intelligentsia as a special stratum of modern capitalist society is characterized by and large precisely by individualism and an incapacity of 
uh, incapacity of discipline and organization. And this trait of the, intelli of the intelligentsia is intimately bound up with its customary way of life, its mode of earning a livelihood, which in a great many respects approximates to the petty, the petty bourgeois mode of existence, uh, such as working in isolation or in very small groups. Uh, Stefan Engels expounds on this and states that uh, petty bourgeois individualism stands in contradiction to the progressive socialization of production. That is the foundation of a proletarian individuality stressing equality, cooperation, and solidarity. This book remarkably lifts up the struggle of the militant workers' movement, Kilusang Mayo Uno, or May One Movement, KMU, a severely red tagged and demonized workers' organizations here in the Philippines by the US Duterte regime. Um, and I, I would like to quote uh, Professor Ness, rural workers in the banana plantations and packing houses require a disciplined working class organization to advance their collective interests to confront a rapacious state which serves the interests of imperial multinational corporations which benefit from the organization of land into plantations for the production and distribution of commodities for consumption in the north and the extraction of surplus value from a ruling working class. In the absence of a strong working class organization like the KMU, workers would have continued to rebel against corporate abuses but would have lacked the organizational capacity to resist the oppression and begin to transform conditions in Mindanao, a region which serves the interests of multinational capital without benefiting the majority of the population of the island. The KMU with a, uh, has supplied an ecumenical strategy of allying with sympathizers the world over while maintaining a principled commitment to the nationalization of all lands and the development of Mindanao for the local population free of imperialist interference." Unquote. Comrade Manny, in his other uh, significant interventions, sheds, sheds light on the dictatorship of the proletariat. This present book fascinatingly demonstrates how scholarship can be reflective of this revolutionary principle even prior to the defeat of fascism and building democracy towards a bright socialist future. Organizing insurgency exemplifies the revolutionary expectations of an insurgency akin to the dictatorship of the proletariat. Lenin in his greetings to the Hungarian workers was of the opinion that the essence of proletarian dictatorship is not in force alone or even mainly in force, but in a systematically waged ideological political struggle for socialist consciousness um, and against bourgeois and petty bourgeois consciousness. And as Lenin states in his state and revolution is the process of transforming labor into life's prime want. The dictatorship of the proletariat as comrade Mandy per, uh, per, persuades us to uh, persuades us through this work and beyond it is not the application of stereotypical administrative measures but the application of ideological political education work in reflecting on the defeat of socialism in the USSR Mao Zedong asked the important question which class has control to the means of production the answer to this question for Mao should be on the ideological political line of an organized proletarian entity and on the class exercising leadership over the economy and the state in theory and practice. This is the same problematic that Emmanuel Ness proposes and answers very well. Academics can indeed be independent of neoliberal constraints and petty bourgeois individualism and creatively apply Marxism, Leninism to today's conditions. Thank you, Professor Ness, for writing a whole book that inspires the fulfillment of this very urgent task. That's all. Uh, thank, th you. thank you, Professor uh, Raimundo. Uh, I would like to, um, uh, you know, once again say that uh, we, you know, obviously have. Uh, have to debate many of these issues probably much longer than just today. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for those uh, comments. Um, I'd now like to uh, make a special introduction uh, to um, Abhinav Sinha, who is uh, editor of uh, the Beagle, Mazdur Beagle, sorry. Uh, and he is um, uh, an activist uh, in India and um, uh, has, has done a lot to advance uh, a very important causes there. Thank you. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Comrade uh, Manny, for this uh, kind introduction. And uh, I would begin, I would like to begin by uh, thanking uh, Pluto Press and Comrade Manny for inviting me to share my views and observations on this 
significant work of uh, Mary and significant work for a variety of reasons. Uh, I'm still reading the book because I got the book a couple of days back uh, and my observations might be a little scattered, but still there were some things which struck me while lead, reading this book. Uh, I think the one of the most important contributions of this book from my own uh, political experience and political perspective is that this book effectively demonstrates the limits of the spontaneous resistance of the working class or the reactive element uh, in the spontaneous working class resistance and the need uh, which this book expresses in a wonderful fashion, the need of a revolutionary party built on revolutionary ideology. This is, I think, very important because uh, generally uh, a lot of people on the left in India also do not understand this uh, fact. There are different kinds of anarcho-syndicalist tendencies within the working class movement of India, which do not understand the basic fact that uh, every class needs a collectivization of its class interests by a vanguard. The, it happens in a different way for bourgeoisie, which is constituted as a class through averaging of the rate of profit in the capitalist economy through competitive process, as what Marx calls the hostile brotherhood of the bourgeoisie is formed through averaging of the rates of profit. And since it is a competitive process and by its very inherent nature, the capitalist class is divided into different compet competing factions it requires a bourgeois state to collectivize its class interests and package it as national interest, the general uh, people's interest. But on the basis of this realization, some people claim that since the inherent principle of proletariat is collectivity, there is no need uh, for a conscious effort to collectivize the class interests of the proletariat they imagine a proletariat which is homogeneous and monolithic. They see no fissures or no uh, uh, cracks within the constitution of the class working of the working class. But the fact is that capitalism imposes various fissures and you know uh, various divisions within the working class. It imposes competition within the labor market. There is a contradiction between skilled and unskilled labor, well-paid labor, less paid labor. Then there are uh, distinction based on different social forms of social identity, regional differences, caste differences in India, for instance. And that is why even the proletariat needs collectivization of its class interests and articulation of this collective class interest as a political in a political form. And that is why this is this emphasis that Manny's book puts on the need of a revolutionary organization, of a revolutionary vanguard and the way in which it demonstrates or reveals the limitations of different kinds of autonomous movements and spontaneous movement, it's uh, one of the most important contributions of this work of men. The second uh, important contribution, as uh, Comrade uh, Sison also pointed out and Comrade Raimundo also pointed out, is it's uh, the way in which the book uh, puts informal sector workers at the center of political struggles. Since in India, for example, 93% of the entire working class belongs to the informal sector. Uh, and uh, it is very important to understand that this new informal sector working class, which has come into existence in the post foldist era, especially since the crisis of 1970s and inauguration of neoliberal globalization, is not a primordial kind of informal working class. Uh, in other words, informality cannot be a metaphor for backwardness. Uh, it is very important to understand and there is a certain kind of technological determinism prevalent even within the circles of revolutionary left which assumes that since informal sector workers dominate in the economy, this working class is backward, primordial in consciousness, backward linkages are dominating in the consciousness of these workers. My own experience as an activist within the informal working class in India for the last 20 years uh, 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 show a completely opposite view because uh, the political conscious, only one aspect of political consciousness is contributed by the kind of technology in which the work, working class is working. 
but most importantly this new informal working class which is jan bremen has correctly termed it as footloose working class it is much more well placed in seeing not one factory owner as its enemy but the class of factory owners as its enemy because within the span of a year this informal worker is working as a rickshaw puller as a uh, you know uh, what again bremen calls a uh, hunter uh, wage hunter and gatherer so he works in one factory in one sector goes to another sector works in a different factory and it is he is at a vantage point he or she is at a vantage point to see the entire class of factory owners of capitalists as, as its enemy and it is much more well placed to transcend the limits put on the consciousness of working class in the fordist period what i call fordist prejudices basically in the period of fordist era this uh, continuity of job tenure job contract and fordism was not only a mode of regulation in the west it was a mode of regulation in indian uh, industrial scene also especially in the period of import substitution uh, industrialization and even after that when a shift was happening towards eli uh, export led industrialization this mode of regulation uh, borrow from regulation in school terminology was there in india for a long time and in that period it was we found the tendencies of economism we found the tendencies of trade unionism dominating the working class movement uh, and uh, i would say that at present i would, would not say that uh, political con class consciousness has you know uh, developed in the indian working class but we can safely say that we are in the valley of the historical time i mean the descent is over the ascent is yet to begin but there are it's a time of potential it's a time of uh, revolutionary potential as nani's book also uh, points out effectively so for example wazirpur is one example of uh, indian industrial scene but indian industrial scene is a mixture of advanced as the book rightly points out advanced manufacturing which is three major automobile hubs are there in india one is in the uh, ncr region gurgaon haruhira bawal region manasar region the other is pune in maharashtra and the third is in chennai tamil nadu and these industrial regions are characterized by very advanced technology even if you look at the indian manufacturing industry uh, the composition of exports from indian industry has changed dramatically in the last 40 years so for example now of all indian exports coffee tea or uh, gems uh, these constitute less than 30% more than 65% of indian constitutes are constituted by uh, manufactured finished manufactured goods not raw materials or intermediate commodities finished manufacturing goods basic chemical and pharmaceutical commodities transport equipment ready made garment electronic goods manufacturing of metals engineering goods these constitute more than 65% of exports from indian industry so it is very important to see that these informal sector smaller firms in india are vertically integrated not only to global supply chains for example wazirpur steel industry supply to major uh, indian capitalist houses for example jindal now uh, since many left india a few years ago wazirpur industrial area has declined now most of the factories have been closed due to two reasons principally one is cheap chinese imports cheap chinese import of uh, intermediate steel commodity and the second is uh, introduction of advanced technologies in steel manufacturing by bigger firms so most of the firms in wazirpur have declined uh, right now it's uh, the it's it presents a very uh, desolate scene if you visit wazirpur industrial area now today so Uh, this is very important contribution of the book i mean the emphasis that it puts on informal sector and the uh, the way in which the work of many speaks from that uh, prejudice that informal workers are primordial they lack class consciousness they even lack the potential to develop a class what lenin called class political consciousness this book effectively uh, uh, demolishes that prejudice and it is the second most important contribution of this book the the third is uh, important contribution of the book i think is that countries like india are no more characterized by semi feudal agriculture i mean if we look at the production relations in at one place in the book uh, 
I haven't read the entire book till now, but at one place it clearly categorically mentions that in most of these countries of global south, the agriculture is now dominated by development of commodity production, differentiation of peasantry. And the case of India confirms this assessment. If we look at uh, the simple, uh, you know, basic figures about Indian agriculture in 2011, for the first time in the history of India, within the rural population, non-agricultural population has become the majority. The agricultural population is 263 million. It was 263 million in 2011. Out of 263 million, 148 million are wage workers who don't have any land only. Then rest, if you look at the rest of the agricultural population, around uh, 10 to 12 million are rich or upper middle farmers engaged in advanced capitalist agriculture, especially in the northwestern India, Punjab, Haryana, uh, northwestern UP, Andhra Pradesh, and different parts of India, which became center of green revolution. And 90 million are small peasants, but these are not small peasant proprietors as discussed by Marx in the 47th chapter of Capital Volume 3. These are not uh, small peasants involved in subsistence farming. These are the marketed surplus of a small and marginal peasants is more than 70%. So what they produce, 70% of that is sold on the market. It is not principally for subsistence. Secondly, this small and marginal peasants have in principle become semi-proletarian because 70% of their income comes not from cultivation, but from wage work. And the size of urban industrial uh, working class is equally huge. I mean, it is almost equal to agricultural uh, proletariat right now. I'm not talk talking simply about industrial workers, I'm talking about urban workers. I mean, engaged in a variety of uh, activities in the informal sector, in the formal sector, etc. The fourth important, uh, I think, contribution of the book is the way in which it uh, uh, underlines the need for international solidarity of the working class of different countries. The way in which it points out, uh, it underlines the need for uh, the proletariat, the working class in the West to understand how the Indian working class or the working class in the global South is exploited in the most brutal conditions, in the most unsafe working conditions. And that realization is very important. But also, uh, along with this realization, the need for the basis of this international solidarity is not simply the wage differential between, I mean, the differential between national wages. It's about the fact of being exploited by capital. In one of the chapters of Capital Volume 1, Marx uh, explaining his theory of wages has a separate chapter on national differences in wages, which is a very important, very short, cha small chapter, six, seven, eight pages, but very important chapter where he shows that uh, national wages of different countries cannot be compared with an imaginary international average wage. So one has to see at the relative real prices of wage goods and the value of labor power in these uh, countries of global south, and they cannot be compared directly with uh, advanced capitalist countries. So the most important basis is, yes, this realization by the working class in advanced capitalist countries that how the production has shifted to global south, how the conditions of exploitation and oppression of working class in the global uh, south and also that they too are exploited by capital, though in a different way, in a different historical political context. So I think it is very important work uh, and uh, there will be a lot of uh, discussions and debates and discourses that will be going on about this book for a long time to come. And I hope uh, that this book and the following discussions about this book will, this book has already uh, developed our understanding of the way in which global capitalism is working right now in a big way. And the following debates and discussions and discourses related to the book will also advance our understanding of the working class struggles. And uh, uh, I'm still reading the book and I'm quite stimulated right now while reading the book. So my observations are not very organized, it's scattered. But last two observations that I wanted to share is that the transfer of value from South to North can be understood without any recourse to uh, Emmanuel's theory of unequal exchange, in my opinion. I know it's a very debatable issue, and, and debate is going on on this question for a long time. 
it can be understood by the laws of international exchange as expounded by Marx himself. Though not in a developed form, it was only a small portion of critique of Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage and theories of surplus value, but it gives very important pointers to understand the way in which global inequality develops in a global capitalist system. So here I'll finish my presentation. Thanks a lot to uh, Google Press and Comrade Manny for giving me time to share my information. Thank you very much, uh, Abhinav, for that stimulating talk. Uh, I think you raise uh, very important questions uh, about uh, um, what we really need to discuss over the course of the coming uh, uh, months, years, and decades. But hopefully, uh, something will result out of uh, all of our works in different ways. Uh, I, I would just like to raise two questions that were um, put forward. Uh, or two ideas that were put forward that I think are crucial in the analysis uh, for the three guests. And also, then I will turn to questions from the uh, audience. Um, and the, the first is that it seems to me that, uh, and I would hope everyone would ask, answer, that um, there is a, a significant difference in understanding the Philippines and India in the sense that um, uh, one is dominated by a comprador class uh, to a certain extent, a comprador of the United States. Uh, and the other, um, India, uh, is not. Uh, but as you pointed out, uh, Abhinav, it is beholden to um, the capitalist classes which the state organizes uh, and represents its interests. And um, so, so that's one question that I'd like to raise. And I was wondering if anyone would like to co uh, comment on. And I have another, which I will say, I'll raise right now so that time permits. And that has to do with um, uh, uh, the weak link theory. Because I think that uh, each of the countries, notwithstanding the question of whether there's a comprador class, uh, represent weak links. And that was one reason why I chose these three countries to tell you the truth. Uh, they all are, if I may say, ripe for some kind of transformation. So uh, I, I, I shall ask um, Professor Sisan if he would uh, like to respond to those, uh, those comments, and then we'll go to the others. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, um, I'm just uh, Professor uh, Joma Sisan, uh, sorry. No. Uh, yes, I agree with you. There's a difference between the, um, the um, social economies of the Philippines and India, although uh, Maoist comrades in India still insist that uh, India uh, has a semi-feudal economy. But uh, um, India looks like Russia. Uh, in, um, in, um, in 1917, because uh, India has some, uh, uh, has some uh, uh, heavy industries. Um, and um, there is an industrial capitalist class there. The national business in the Philippines is quite weak. Um, it has been weakened from uh, uh, one form of uh, uh, so-called development in the Philippines uh, uh, to another. Uh, the, this national bourgeoisie, um, well, the, the, you're correct in saying that the ruling class in the Philippines uh, is big comprador landlord. Uh, the big comprador bourgeoisie is land-based, uh, the biggest uh, of the big compradors uh, have big land holdings while they have banks and uh, uh, big uh, uh, trading companies and some, uh, some uh, uh, import dependent uh, manufacturing. Um, but none of the heavy and basic industries that India uh, already has. Uh, so you have some uh, enclaves of industrial capitalism uh, in uh, India but uh, still surrounded by a um, uh, by an ocean eh, of uh, uh, feudalism and um, um, 
So that's uh, uh, and uh, a lot of backwardness. And um, uh, the Philippines uh, has been victimized by its good fortune of having uh, rich natural resources. So uh, even when uh, the U.S. would allow Japan to reconstruct and uh, uh, regain its position as a top industrial capitalist power, um, and uh, for a while the Philippines seemed to be, you know, more even more better off than uh, 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 Japan. But only in a few years' time, the Philippines would. Uh, um, uh, easily be seen as the source of mineral uh, ores and logs for uh, uh, for Japan. Then there was this uh, time when the so-called newly industrializing countries were being promoted. Uh, um, and uh, up to the time that uh, the so-called frontline economies of Taiwan and South Korea were being built to uh, uh, to, com uh, to to um, a shine against uh, in the industrial North Korea and uh, and uh, uh, the promise of uh, socialist uh, socialist industry in um, uh, what what was the socialist industrialization going on in China, but then um, the Philippines was kept by the U.S. Um, as a uh, simply uh, a source of raw materials. And uh, when the so-called export-oriented manufacturing was, uh, was, in, uh, was, uh, was pushed in the Philippines since late 1970s, and, uh, up to uh, uh, the uh, um, policy regime of neoliberalism, the, uh, the Philippines, the only new thing that the Philippines got was, you know, um, the use of, uh, was the export of live men and women as cheap labor eh, for uh, 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 so many countries of the world, no? So that's the, uh, that's the, that's the, uh, um, uh, that's how I characterize the Philippine economy. So <laughs> to be brief, uh, uh, India has some uh, strategic and basic industries in the hands of the an industrial bourgeoisie. Uh, but uh, uh, of course, India is not uh, is not uh, uh, yet uh, qualified as a member of uh, uh, G seven. <laughs> Okay, Sarah. Sarah, please unmute. Unmute. Sarah, you're, yeah. you're muted. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I certainly agree with uh, Kajoma's characterization of both the differences between uh, the economies, the political economies of India and the Philippines, particularly his characterization of um, um, the um, political economy in the Philippines. I, I would just like to add that um, I think those two questions are connected in that what makes these two countries uh, the weakest link uh, to an imperialist system are precisely its uh, respective compradors, uh, which Kajoma uh, has already described quite extensively. Um, feudalism being the social base of global capitalism, particularly in the Philippines, um, is made possible to a large extent by um, the comprador elite that has um, hijacked the state. And uh, what really is interesting uh, right now um, especially if we uh, take a comparative approach to India and the Philippines would be, uh, while there are um, differences in terms of, uh, say, uh, their um, economies, um, Duterte and Modi have really adopted a, uh, sim uh, have adopted similar policies um, spanning from um, social policies attacking um, you know, uh, vulnerable classes. Uh, from there to um, um, new um, so-called uh, new uh, uh, tax policies, and um, and also um, some readjustments on um, basically um, agrarian policies, which are supposed to be reforms, but uh, really uh, they've only functioned as um, attacks on uh, the peasant class. 
Uh, so, um, and then of course, uh, right now, India is also part of uh, the so-called Quad uh, that the U.S. is um, informally um, organizing uh, to protect us, to protect uh, the uh, to protect uh, Southeast Asia from Chinese incursions. So, I think those are significant developments and uh, parallelisms uh, between these two um, countries at the moment in relation to U.S. imperialism. Abhinav. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the Indian capitalist class is predominantly an industrial financial capitalist class. Because if you look at the share of uh, trade in Indian, Indian economy, it's less than 17%. Whereas industry and production of intangible commodities in the service sector, because the entire service sector is not cannot be considered uh, as a commodity production. There is there is uh, financial services and productive sectors, but there is there's transport, for example. Transport and communication, that is the production of intangible commodity. In fact, Marx gives the instance of transport as a special commodity whose production and consumption coincides in time. The process of production of that commodity is also at the same time always already the process of consumption of that commodity. So it is very clear that, uh, and Mao in 1939 text Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese Revolution says that an industrial bourgeoisie cannot be a comprador because it wants market. So it is definitely not comprador, it is definitely not imperialist, and it is definitely not national. But all these characterizations of different types of bourgeoisie emerged historically at certain junctures of time. And one cannot cut one's feet to fit the shoe. So there is a new conceptualization for types of Indian bourgeoisie that is needed, what we call junior partners of imperialism, who are politically independent and economically partially dependent on imperialism. So uh, that is how we characterize Indian bourgeoisie. And I think uh, India, in certain respect, yes, it can be compared in certain ways to Russia of 1970s, but not very much because in India, the Peasantry is not a dominant class. Agriculture is not characterized by feudalism because the character of ground rent is no more fuel. If you look at any study of ground rent in Indian agriculture, it is capitalist ground rent, which is shared between the rentier landlord class and the capitalist farmer class. It is not, the entire surplus labor is not appropriated by the rentier landlord, which happens in the feudal, in the case of feudal ground rent. And if you look at the differentiation of peasantry also. So I wouldn't say that there are limited conclaves of industrial development surrounded by sea of feudalism because feudalism is not equivalent to backwardness. Feudalism uh, refers to a particular set of production relations. Uh, one has to see that. And in my own study, there is debate going on. And among Indian Maoists also, there are different you know, groups and organizations and parties and intellectuals. CPI Maoist obviously considers India as a semi-feudal, semi-colonial country. There are some parties which consider India as a new colony, but there are also Maoist organizations and parties and they are perfectly Maoist as they believe in the immortal contributions of Mao as GPCR, contribution of GPCR and all. So uh, they also, there are Maoist groups and parties which consider India a relatively backward capitalist country of a post-colonial time, post-colonial, not post-colonial in the Gatri Chakravarti Spivak sense. So just as a temporal uh, characterization. So uh, I think, and coming to Manny's point, uh, weak links, I think weak, the theory of weak link originally had nothing to do with a country being uh, semi-feudal or it, uh, it's being a, a commercial colony or neo-colony. Uh, I think it's about the fact which Manny's book points out perfectly uh, well, that the Storm centers of revolutions have shifted to global south in present terminology, not in Lenin's terminology, because the bulk of uh, production is going on there. It has the largest working class. Uh, the brutal conditions of uh, work and production in these countries lead to intensification of contradiction between capital and labor in a much more sharp way in these countries. So weak links in itself and by itself uh, uh, my reading is that it has nothing to do with a country being semi-colonial or national question being not resolved or uh, the democratic tasks not being fulfilled. 
it's about the weight of exploitation, relative weight of exploitation as it is distributed uh, in different parts of the world. So yeah, these are my few observations. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a few more questions, but I think I will uh, revert to the uh, people who are um, posting questions. And uh, I urge uh, the audience to uh, ask questions as uh, they would like. Uh, uh, they will all be uh, discussed. Uh, I, I guess I shouldn't mention the name of the, the, the person asking the question, but uh, the first question is, uh, what about the neo-fascist danger in both the global south and in the home countries of the imperialist powers, even after the removal of uh, uh, the US Trump? Some people might argue he was or was not a fascist. I'm not going to go there. Go ahead. I, I guess in particular, the references uh, that Sarah made uh, were apropos uh, in terms of uh, her uh, distinction uh, uh, between uh, you know, other countries and uh, the Philippines and India both have those kinds of leaders. So I'll leave it there. Uh, Professor Sisan, would you like to go first? May I make, may I make the, the answer? Well, we, we have seen the phenomena, phenomenon of, um, of uh, Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, and, uh, and then Modi of India, and uh, Duterte in the Philippines. So um, uh, the, this uh, ultra-right uh, uh, type of uh, leader as a reason. It is as if uh, there, is, there is some kind of conspiracy from, from the dark state of the US and, there's, uh, and they, they arranged the, the uh, election of this uh, uh, reaction, ultra-reactionary politicians. But I don't think there's such a conspiracy. Um, this is a, um, a phenomenon uh, consequent to the gravity of the crisis of the world capitalist system, uh, the bourgeoisie uh, promotes right-wing leaders when um, uh, you know when it um, uh, uses up the uh, the, the old-time conservatives, the liberals, the social democrats, and so on. Then um, um, the times have really have become so serious. That now, now that they uh, resort to use to the use of uh, of fascistic leaders or fascistoids no? uh, as leaders, and uh, um, the classical uh, emergence of fascist leaders in Italy and um, in uh, Germany is still uh, uh, worth uh, remembering, and um, uh, the big capitalist finance. Uh, uh, fascist movements, and um, in order to deflect the attention of the masses of the people from the root causes of, of the crisis. So um, with the high degree of globalization in the world, uh, it's not uh, surprising that you have a good spread eh, of fascistoid or fascistic leaders um, uh, emerging at the same time. So. I think that uh, neoliberalism, uh, neoliberalism has so aggravated uh, the crisis of the world ca capitalist system. The crisis of overproduction, so many things have been overproduced, and yet the incomes and uh, employment of people have gone down. And, and uh, so um, you, have, uh, uh, you have this problem since the time of Marx. Uh, uh, the crisis of overproduction, uh, 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 jolting the entire capitalist system. And um, uh, when the old devices fail, uh, they bring out uh, the more brazen weapons like fascism. And um, um, I think uh, if I may uh, go far afield, no? uh, you see, uh, I stand for the world proletarian revolution. I advocate world proletarian revolution, with of course, uh, my focus is uh, on the Philippine struggle. But, uh, you know, 
Uh, I uh, became politically conscious uh, in the uh, period after World War II. And I have seen the high point, uh, uh, the high point of socialist revolutions uh, and national liberation movements. I think that was 1956. But exactly in 1956, modern revisionism arose. And um, uh, there has been a, um, sequence, a sequence of major events in which uh, the working class has taken a beating um, because of the revisionism in the, in social, in the pre former socialist countries and then uh, those uh, parties outside, um, uh, 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 communist parties outside under the influence of the Soviet Union uh, became infected by, uh, by uh, revisionism. And then um, uh, I'll take uh, to be very concrete, no? Uh, you know, we were all so happy about the victory of the Vietnamese people in 1975, no? But we should not miss the point that U.S. imperialism was uh, so clever and so brutal to make a big gain in Indonesia, eh? uh, ahead of the of, uh, ahead of the Indonesian, uh, ahead of the Vietnamese uh, victory. Eh? There was the massacre of the communists. Uh, because in the first place, the communists were not ready eh, for uh, people's war. Um, they were also afflicted by some amount of provisionism, you know, the, the road of peaceful transition and so on and so forth. So, but anyway, uh, there has been a sequence of events. Uh, uh, U.S. was in trouble. U.S. was in trouble um, after the um, other capitalist countries ruined by the war. Um, um, reconstructed. And so the happy period of 1945-75 in which, you know, uh, one, the head of the family, uh, or the head of the American family could earn enough for the family and uh, have good times. Um, and then the, the U.S. Uh, uh, made the foolish mistake of uh, engaging in wars of aggression. So it, uh, the, the U.S. started its strategic decline but then it would be able to uh, um, uh, at least uh, knock down yeah? uh, where it, uh, it lost some, some fights, but it gained uh, uh, in other fights. And then it was able to make use of neoliberalism uh, from, the, um, from 90 onwards. Uh, uh, they were able to manipulate uh, China uh, against the socialist cause. Um, so, um, uh, the, uh, but anyway, neoliberalism as the, um, as the big advantage for U.S. imperialism and for the world capitalist system with all the devices of putting down the working people. And, you know, um, there's an, uh, there's a, an important trick of neo neoliberalism. Keep on borrowing, eh? Keep on uh, uh, let the households, the corporations, and the state keep on borrowing uh, to, you know, uh, to to um, uh, postpone the disaster. But this uh, public debt now has become uh, the big bubble that that might develop. But before that, we already see how people have been um, beaten down. Uh, the conditions of exploitation and oppression have so become grave that I think uh, since 2019, uh, the rise of anti-imperialist and democratic struggles um, has been very marked. And I think this will go on. And um, I think this is the uh, prelude, and uh, this is the prelude uh, to the resurgence of the world capitalist system. At the moment, the most promising revolutionary struggles are in, um, oh, modesty aside, in the Philippines, an archipelagic country, which is not a, a very good base. Eh? It can only be as good for being a torch bearer of the revolution. I'm banking on India as the, <laughs> as the big scale country. <laughs> where, where you know, um, I, I tell my, I tell Indian comrades, oh, you uh, just as the, uh, just as Russia was the big country eh, that launched the socialism for the first time, that built socialism for the first time, and then China came next. I think now eh, uh, the duty of India 
to become the big scale country where uh, large armies can arise to uh, to uh, beat the uh, whatever the imperialists and the reactionaries can uh, offer. <laughs> okay, um, uh, I have a, I have a second another question that's probably more apropos for. Uh, Sarah, so maybe Abhinav, do you want to respond to this uh, uh, since it was directly uh, directed toward India? And then I will move to Sarah with a question from uh, the audience. Yeah, just a very small thing. Uh, to, uh, we are trying in India and I can assure you that we are not leaving any stone unturned, but the situation is very grave and very difficult. So it's a constant struggle. Just a small point that I wanted about wanted to make about Trump, uh, Bolsonaro, Modi, Duterte. Uh, I totally agree with Comrade uh, Sison that these, the rise of these extreme right-wing figures is an expression of the deepening crisis that we are witnessing. And in some ways, it is also different from the times of Nazi rise and fascist rise in Germany and Italy, because right now we are going through a, what Marxist political economists are now calling a long depression since 1970s. And since it is a long protracted period of uh, crisis, the reaction also has become less sudden, less contingent, at least uh, apparently, and it has become a systematic part of all these third world countries. But not all of them can be characterized as fascist because in my opinion, fa the difference here is specific of fascism from other forms of extreme right wing reaction is existence of a cadre based party, which Modi has in form of RSS. So uh, Trump, I think, was it's a very good word that uh, Comrade Sison used, fascistoid. Uh, uh, one of our comrades in the US said that US in US, the fascist movement was ready, but the fascist vanguard was not ready. Trump was not the <laughs> uh, consensus candidate of American bourgeoisie. But since fascism also emerges as a romantic upheaval of petty bourgeoisie, uh, in the U.S. disillusioned in this period of uh, depression, snatching away of all the privileges, there is a strong social base of reaction in the petty bourgeoisie and labor aristocracy as well. And Trump rode that wave. But India, uh, American big bourgeoisie still was not in consensus about Trump being its representative candidate, but that's how things turned out. So I think it is very important to make this distinction between different forms of extreme right-wing reaction and fascism on the other hand, because it has a strong bearing on the strategies of working class resistance to these different forms of extreme right-wing reaction. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Sarah, you may want to uh, uh, respond to that question, but I have a, a second question as well, uh, because I want to make sure that we get everyone in. Um, uh, can worker movements of the global south intertwine with the rights of migrant workers abroad. Uh, this, is a, this is from Nepal, as I pointed out, I think. Uh, or is it centered in the domestic arena only? And of course, you know, the, both the Philippines and India are big labor expo export countries. Go ahead. Um, yeah, that's definitely the strategy for organizing um, of um, migrant Filipino workers in different parts of the world. As you know, um, we have a labor export policy in the Philippines and um, the manner in which uh, organizations uh, such as Migrante International in different parts of the world where there are Filipino workers are organizing is such that um, we are tracing the uh, roots of migration to uh, the kind of uh, political economy that we have in the Philippines, which is the absence of an industrial base on account of um, the monopoly of land by uh, the, uh, the the bourgeois compradors in, in the country. So uh, definitely our organized um, comrades, say in the US, in, um, in North America, in, in Hong Kong, in the Middle East, um, in Europe, uh, are uh, are not only supporting or are not only supportive of uh, the campaigns, the anti-imperialist and anti-fascist campaigns um, here in the Philippines, but they are actually connecting their experience of uh, diaspora um, and, of course, um, labor exploitation, and of course, their experience of being second-class citizens in 
in uh, the in countries where they work as um, basically the consequence of uh, the Philippines being a, uh, a semi-feudal, um, uh, semi-colonial economy. Uh, so there is really a need to be able to organize around that. Um, and um, I, I would like to respond to the earlier question. I think the question, the way I understand it was that uh, now that Trump is has been dislodged, is there... Uh, has fascism ended? Um, the the U.S. imperialist state and Duterte's puppet state are actually fully consolidated and unite and united in increasing capacity building for so-called um, uh, the military modernization program, which is none other than the implementation of U.S. coin or U.S. counterinsurgency. And of course, uh, we, we know that the alliance between the U.S. and the Philippines is the longest and the most crucial anchor for uh, U.S. hegemony in, in Southeast Asia and is actually right now central to the emerging um, U.S.-China competition and the new Cold War that the U.S. pursues to advance its um, national interests amidst um, deep economic crisis. So for Biden and Duterte, uh, cultivating the so-called um, U.S.-Philippine alliance is uh, on, you know, uh, is on uh, uh, of, uh, one of the top priorities of, uh, of, of Joe Biden on account of his determination to thwart um, Chinese expansionism in the Asia Pacific. Of course, this has uh, this impacts on uh, our military budget and, of course, Duterte's um, creation of uh, the um, National Task Force Ending Local Communist Conflict, which has a budget of uh, 16 billion pesos. And uh, surely U.S. counterinsurgency is contributing to that. And, of course, uh, it, it the whole project is uh, casting the net wider, calling the armed network uh, calling the armed group a network and has only uh, so far incarcerated critics, activists, uh, social development workers, and um, the New People's Army, uh, the communist New People's Army is steadily expanding. So um, we don't think that fascism at, uh, has ended once the American people voted Trump out of uh, uh, US presidency. Thank you. Uh, I might just answer that question around Nepal, uh, and maybe others will respond in a certain way. Um, Nepal is a labor export state without question. Uh, most of that labor export goes to East Asia, uh, to a lesser extent, other parts of the world. And, um, you know, I, I actually think that um, the, the best way to uh, advance the rights of migrants is, is through creating socialism in a certain way, where people would not have to leave their countries where they would have the opportunity to become uh, self-sufficient on their own. And this is something that's not just exclusive to Nepal, but many other countries around the world. I just wanted to make that point, but I, I, I'm trying to, so I'm going, going to ask a few more questions. Some are directed. Uh, did anyone else want to answer the question about migration? Okay, so uh, there's, a, there's a question or a statement uh, in the from Chicago, in the exemplary demonstration of internationalism by the three speakers, or by the book, uh, um, and this event is uh, demonstrating it. I think it's time we further facilitate organizing. Uh, would the authors or Pluto Press, by extension, make a hub where even viewers now can join, connect, and start collaborating? So I think that that question is for uh, Pluto, uh, but it may be for us too. Uh, so I think uh, something that we should, I don't know if anybody wants to respond to that. Uh, another question which is directed to uh, Abhinav Sinha, uh, specifically, uh, can you elaborate more about difference of the difference of labor trade union theory of Marx and center periphery relations of Wallerstein? Uh, more theoretical. Yeah. Uh, what is the first part uh, about uh, trade unions? Uh, go back. Uh, can you elaborate more about the difference of lab labor trade union, forgive me, labor trade theory, labor trade, not union, 
labor trade okay. theory. Yeah, sorry about that. So I'm I'll say it again. About Can you elaborate labor. more about difference of labor trade theory of Marx and center periphery relations of Wallerstein? And and that maybe others would like to speak to that. No, I, I'm not sure what uh, uh, is the meaning of labor trade theory of Marx, uh, but uh, as far as Wallerstein's world system theory is concerned, I think there have been systematic responses from Marxist political economists to this particular variant of dependency theory because it is an extension of dependency theory itself. So it's a very, uh, this question warrants a very long answer, so I can't answer this entire question, but I would refer to uh, the uh, uh, person who has asked this question to read uh, Anwar Sheikh's criticism of dependency school and uh, world systems theory and John Week's criticism of uh, world systems theory and uh, dependency theory. It basically, it homogenizes an entire uh, global area and uh, as periphery and another as core, which doesn't fit the actual, uh, you know, actual uh, condition of global capitalism, actual status of global capitalism. But this would take a lot of time. So I would just prefer you to read Sheikh's critique and John Week's critique of world systems theory. Okay, here's a question, uh, the next question, which is directed to me, uh, but I think it's directed to all of us in some, some respect. Um, in my research uh, and my studies, uh, what did I discover about the best methods for workers to keep their respective revolutionary parties accountable to its working class base and interests? So that's directed to me, and I guess I, I'll respond to that then but I think every one of you should respond as well. Uh, my view is that uh, the workers today, where the working class, as well as the broad masses, uh, do not have any kind of accountability. Uh, and that's one of the major points of this book, precisely because of the question of spontaneity and the question of the fact that there is absolutely no kind of uh, organizational power that is able to articulate the democratic urges and uh, aspirations of the working class. And so it is in fact the party itself that is the um, resonator of the working class's uh, aspirations. Um, and it's through the party and the trade union organization as a subordinate to the party that those uh, interests are articulated. Without the party, all we have are spontaneous movements, protests, et cetera, without any accountability at all, you just have uh, a, a certain sense of anarchy, uh, which some people actually may prefer. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, uh, Professor Sison, and maybe he would like to uh, talk about the importance of uh, representing working class interests through um, the, the, the party uh, and so forth. Can you repeat the question? Uh, Basically, the question is, how, how does the party uh, maintain its accountability to the working class? Which is... In a country, again, uh, can I answer the question? In a country like the Philippines, um, uh, the working class is still a minority class, but it's still a far bigger class eh, than, let's say, the liberal bourgeoisie that led the revolution of 1896. So uh, the, the working class is the most uh, progressive and most productive uh, force um, in the country. And um, uh, it, um, when you speak of making revolution, making uh, uh, an advance uh, towards the completion of the new democratic revolution and moving forward to socialism, uh, the working class is the agency. And uh, the peasantry is what you call a dissolving class. As you uh, advance in industrial development, it uh, dissolves. 
Um, but of course, uh, the peasantry uh, gets prolonged because the uh, U.S. imperialism, the imperialist powers, and the local reactionaries make it a point uh, to keep labor cheap, to keep the country underdeveloped, to make the peasantry uh, the everlasting source of cheap labor. And that's a, that is the special assignment of the Philippines. And the Philippines has been very much victimized eh? when China became capitalist. Uh, uh, up to this time, China has been the worst in taking out mineral ores without any recording. Eh? That's the worst case now. They, they, they corrupt the politicians. Um, at the national level and at provincial levels, and they take out mineral ores of all kinds, including lithium from the uh, topsoil of the uh, Philippines. Um, even the making of artificial islands uh, involves taking soil from the Philippines. That's how, uh, that's how brazen uh, Chinese imperialism is. So, but anyway, the working class has to be the leading class. It is the, the theory. Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. It is the practical experience, and um, it is uh, um, uh, it is positive. There are positive lessons and neg as well as negative lessons to learn. Uh, I take note of the negative lessons because there has been some setback because of modern um, because of modern revisionism that uh, uh, that um, corresponded to the maneuvers of imperialism and made the big setbacks to the socialist uh, cause. Um, now, accountability, of course, uh, um, there is uh, freedom and uh, discipline within the party. Um, it, uh, it, the party is responsible for the ideological and political leadership. It is centralized um, um, uh, ideological and political leadership, but that, of course, it is based on, uh, on democracy. Uh, information, views, and so on, opinions from, uh, um, uh, from below, from the grassroots, uh, this go up, uh, uh, this go up for uh, crystallization and uh, uh, decisions are made at the, at the central level for uh, decisions that need to be made for the entire country. Now, and, but uh, the Philippines has a special character. Um, uh, it is archipelagic, so uh, it's, uh, emphatically uh, there is a need for decentralized operations. Um, you cannot make a long march in China, continuous long march, and then you don't. You cannot move armies uh, over uh, over uh, large landscapes. So, so uh, most likely. <laughs> the, uh, and the Philippines can be penetrated anytime. Huh? In in uh, you know in the central part of the Philippines is you know it's a clutter of islands. So the Spaniards came and uh, the Una uh, the U.S. came. They they came through such uh, 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 you know in the right in the middle of the country. So um, uh, it is absolutely necessary to build uh, uh, battalions and regiments within the major islands. Um, um, Armies of the size in China cannot be uh, done. In uh, that's why I place so much hope on India, uh, because it is the scale and the, uh, the population for the big battles. And then, uh, uh, and uh, I tend to uh, to laugh uh, laugh away uh, some comments of Indian comrades. Oh, comrades, there are so Maoist parties there; they grow like coconut trees in Kerala, uh, but. <laughs> But uh, I, I think it's all right to have the competition. May, may the party, which can build the party, may, may build the people's army like uh, Mao Zedong and uh, Shude, eh? uh, be become the leader eventually. Now, um, um, accountability um, uh, involves, it's, it's, it's a large term. Uh, the, uh, of course, uh, in my experience, um, uh, in, in, in the building of the party, you get a lot of petty bourgeois who are progressive, but the most solid uh, cadres come from the working class. And we used to cure 
uh, to counteract the possible um, uh, overstress on on the petty bourgeois cadres by teaming up workers with uh, with uh, uh, educated youth uh, when we deploy them to the countryside. So and um, uh, it's the best combination. It's the best combination. And then workers are highly educated. Uh, there are so many of them who finish, who go beyond high school. They can grasp, they can read theory. Um, and so uh, the, the, the uh, petty bourgeois, educated, uh, intelligentsia, is not so far beyond them. Um, and um, uh, having such uh, well-educated workers, formally and well-educated in Marxism-Leninism, uh, they cannot be pushed around by uh, intellectuals. No? They themselves become proletarian intellectuals. And, um, and so uh, there is good interaction between the party and the working class. And um, um, of course, uh, uh, there is a working class, there are working class organizations in the Philippines within the National Democratic Front, illegal and more connected to the armed struggle. You have the, you have the Revolutionary Council of Trade Unions, you have Kasama, and the party itself is a party of the proletariat. So th those are the three major organizations. Um, and of course, uh, um, um, the uh, legal legal um, uh, labor organizations uh, at so many levels uh, have their own autonomy. And I'm going to say that uh, they enjoy a lot of independence. And I say this especially uh, to uh, ward off any, uh, any, any, any kind of red tagging uh, by the authorities, by the uh, fascistic authorities in the Philippines. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, considering uh, the time constraints we have, I think we could only give two minutes per speaker. Uh, I think that will, uh, and then we can wrap it up. Uh, uh, so Sarah, would you uh, go next? And thank you very much, Professor Cisana. It was very enlightening. Um, to answer the question or to wrap up? Uh, to, if you want to respond, you don't have to. Uh, yeah. No, I, I, I'm okay. I'm okay. Okay, I think it's okay. been answered. Thank you. I was about to say, actually, uh, Professor Sinha, <laughs> Abhinav. Sorry, I'm not a professor, <laughs> Manny, you know that. <laughs> I just want to... Uh, no, the, it's always a two-way process. So, uh, uh, about the accountability of party towards the class and how class can ensure it, I think the basic tendency has been uh, a pretty bourgeois tendency is to pit the party against the class. A party is the advanced detachment of the proletariat. As long as divisions between mental and manual labor exist in society, there will be a friendly contradiction between the party and the class. There is a gap between the party and the class and it's a constant dialectical process, a constant dialectical problem which can be resolved by two basic things. One, as Mao said, revolutionary mass line learning from the masses, uh, gathering the scattered knowledge from the masses, uh, determining what is correct on the basis of mastering Marxist theory, and developing that scattered knowledge by generalizing it and developing it into a political line, a class uh, proletarian political line. And second thing is democratic centralism within the party, which can be basically summarized into one thing. As long as the line is determined, Full democracy till the line is determined, full democracy. Once the line is determined, full centralism. Without that, party two exists in a class society, and it has to. It is a fighting detachment. It cannot be a club or discussion club. But uh, uh, the problem of relation between the class and party, there is no full, uh, you know, one-time panacea or solution for that. It's a process of. It's a question of constant struggle, which can be resolved by these two weapons that Marxism, Leninism, Maoism has given us, revolutionary mass line and democratic centralism. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Um, I mean, Sarah, do you want to say uh, 30 words, uh, 30 seconds, <laughs> or do you want to wrap it? Uh, or we're, 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 I think we're finished. Uh, there are many more questions. I'm very sorry for those who did not get their chance uh, to uh, 
uh, hear responses from uh, all of us. I think every one of us uh, really are grateful for everyone who's come. Um, I, I can't speak about my own book. I'm not very good at that, but uh, I hope people have a chance to read it and uh, uh, criticize it and uh, learn from it, hopefully. Um, and I now will turn it over to uh, James Kelly of Pluto Press. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, and a very big thanks to all of our speakers. Don't forget to purchase your copy of Organizing Insurgency from plutobooks.com. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you.